Before we turn to God's Word, let me just mention to you two things that you will find in the vestibule this morning. One is a list of the titles of this present series in which we are engaged, uh, a brief series of seven sermons on being children of God. Um, That is available in the vestibule and I think possibly on the stairwells. Also in the vestibule you'll find a cut off of the article which many of you have been asking me uh, if we could have copies of available which I wrote in the Herald. Uh, That's this one and it's available if you want it in the vestibule this morning. Now we turn together this morning to 2 Peter chapter 3 where our reading was. And as we have our Bibles open before us, we bow together to seek God's grace and illumination. Let's pray together. Father, we confess our utter dependence upon the light that your Holy Spirit is pleased to shed upon the written page of your word. And we ask that now you would speak to us Open our understanding, open my lips and anoint them that they may speak only your words. Open our hearts that for the glory of your name we may not merely be hearers of the word, but doers of it also. We ask it through Jesus Christ, our glorious Saviour. Amen. So far in this series on being children of God, we have dealt with two of the subjects that you'll find on the leaflet. They both concern the question, how do I become a child of God? The answer that Scripture gives is by two sovereign acts of God which He performs upon us. One is the new birth from above. The other is God's sovereign decision to adopt us into his family, to give us the privileges and blessings and status of his children. It's about these privileges that Dr. Sinclair Ferguson will be speaking to us this evening when he comes in our evening service to the fourth of our themes. But this morning we turn to what is obviously the next question and that is how do I grow as God's child? Our theme is therefore the growth of God's children. The importance of it I hope it will be unnecessary to convince you of for the simple reason that we see the evidence of this in physical human life, where arrested development is one of the tragedies that we face in a fallen world. Whether we are speaking about physical growth or about mental development or about emotional development, wherever you find it arrested, there is always tragedy there. But the saddest thing of all to see in any life of a Christian believer and the most tragic thing in the Christian church is to discover arrested spiritual development. That is the picture that so often confronts us of people who have been converted to Jesus Christ years ago but are still in spiritual babyhood. It's manifest that in the New Testament that problem confronted the apostles and broke the heart of people like the Apostle Paul. Let me read you some words John Stott has written trenchantly on this subject. Our churches, he says, are full of Christians who were not only born again years ago, but who stopped growing 
years ago. They have never graduated beyond the nursery. They want to be amused or entertained. They only have an appetite for spiritual confectionery and no hunger for solid food. The sight is distressing and the prospect for the church infinitely serious. That, of course, is why Peter, when he begins his first epistle, we read the last chapter of the second epistle this morning, but when he begins his first epistle, he calls upon his brothers and sisters to praise God with him who has given us new birth. But then when he comes into the second chapter of that first epistle, He urges those who have been born like newborn babes crave spiritual milk that by it you may grow up in your salvation. And significantly, he closes his correspondence, his last words in the New Testament that we have are our text for this morning. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. To Him be glory. Peter was burdened in the words of Paul to present every man mature in Christ. What I think made the matter more poignant as well as more urgent for the apostle, was that he could look back and everybody else knew about it to the time when he had been retarded spiritually through his disobedience, through his refusal of the God-given pathway to discipleship and growth. And Peter unquestionably knew what it was to suffer the retarding power of the world and the flesh and the devil. And the tears and anguish that he went through were enough to make him cry to God and to his people that they might grow and go on. Do you notice how he introduces this last verse, which is our text, by saying, therefore, dear friends, since you already know this, that is, you know that time is short, you know that Christ is coming, you know that you're not going to be here forever, you know there is a day of reckoning arriving, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of lawless men and fall from your secure position. But... Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Peter is burdened that they might grow. Nothing could be more important. Now, I want us to turn to these words for the rest of our time and consider them just a little and you will need to explore them further because there is no more important theme for us to give ourselves to. My dear friends, there is nothing that that godless world out there needs so desperately as distinctive godliness in the lives of mature Christian men and women in the church. Because it is in us that they see whatever they will see of Jesus Christ. And if the vision they have is one that is watered down and puerile and misleading, how tragic, not just for the state of the church, but for the state of the world. And so we are going to think this morning from this verse of the source of spiritual growth, the nature of spiritual growth, the means of spiritual growth, and the goal 
of spiritual growth because it does have a distinctive goal. A word about where it comes from, the source of spiritual growth. And I think there is a strong clue to the answer in the phrase that comes at the beginning of verse 18 of 2 Peter 3. Grow in the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You will know that some of the versions have grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The NIV has grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Greek simply says grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And we speak often about growing in grace. Grace is God's free, unmerited mercy by which He saves and sanctifies sinners. That is, not only saves them from their sins by that grace, but transforms their lives until the day when they go into the presence of the Savior towards reflecting His image in them. And that's what salvation is, of course. Salvation is not just deliverance from God's judgment. Salvation is salvation to make us more and more and more like Jesus Christ. And the author of it all is God Himself. And I want to say to you this morning for the sake of clarity at this point that there is nothing that will contribute towards your growth in grace which is not to be found in Jesus Christ Himself. He is the source of everything we need. The Apostle Paul says to the Corinthians, He is our righteousness. He is our wisdom. He is our sanctification. He is our redemption. Everything the believer needs, my dear friend, is in Jesus Christ. And therefore, it is vital to grasp that we are not only born anew by grace, and adopted into God's family by grace, we grow through the grace of God also. So it doesn't matter who may be involved in your spiritual development. You will be in exactly the same position that Paul describes to the Corinthians again when he says, Paul may plant, Apollos may water, but it is God. God who gives the growth. Where does growth come from? It is inescapably true, according to the New Testament. It comes from God. Spiritual growth comes from God. Now, if you just think with me for a moment about the second subject I want to touch upon from here, that is the nature of spiritual growth. You will see why this is so. What is the nature of spiritual growth? Well, Peter helps us earlier on in this letter. It's just a page back in my copy of the NIV, and it probably is in yours too, if you just turn one page back to chapter 1 of Second Peter. You will discover in verse 5 that Peter is describing growth by a different metaphor, adding to your faith. For this reason, make every effort to add to your faith. Now, notice what it is that he wants to be added to our faith. Goodness, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, kindness, love. Now, what are these things, my dear friends? What are such things as goodness, godliness, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, love? These are the fruit of the Holy Spirit. That's what these are. They are the lineaments of biblical godliness. They are a reflection of the character of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Now, who can produce that in the life of a sinner like you and me? Who can take the unlikely material of a life like mine and work into it godliness and goodness and self-control and perseverance and love, I tell you, the only answer is God Himself. And who can make me like Jesus? Who in God's name can make us gathered here in St. George's Tron this morning like Jesus Christ? I tell you, it's only God who can do it. And what a glorious, glorious thing that is. Because, you know, it would drive us out of this building in absolute despair if I were to say to you, these are the marks of spiritual growth. Go out and get them. I tell you, I would come down the stairs from this pulpit in anguish of despair because I do not know where in God's name, in my own heart, that could come from. But I do know that it's all in the Lord Jesus Christ and He can make me. He can take this common clay and make me reflect the beauty of Jesus Christ. And he can do that for every one of his children. So that at the end of the day when somebody asks, and of course we will be totally unaware of it ourselves, what has happened in your life? We will give the same answer as the Apostle Paul. By the grace of Of God, I am what I am. Now that will not only keep us from pride, it will also hearten us beyond anything else in the world that God not only can do that, but that there is nothing uppermost more in his heart than to do it. But I think there is more to this phrase, grow in grace, even than that. I was puzzling and pondering over it yesterday and was speaking to Chuck on the telephone and he um, was interested in the subject too. He came up with this and I plagiarize his thoughts freely with his permission, which I honestly asked for. Human growth, you know, is marked by something very obvious to all of us, isn't it? Human growth is marked by a growth in independence. We talk about weaning a child away from dependence on its mother for food. We speak about the gradual way in which a child doesn't need to be supported anymore. It can stand freely. We speak about the independence that our children are gradually achieving until it is absolute and the whole thing turns the other way around and their parents become dependent on them. I've been looking forward to that all my life. (laughs) But it's true, isn't it? Now, spiritual growth is precisely the opposite. Spiritual growth is getting to know Jesus Christ more and more so that I become more and more dependent on him. So that the whole of my life draws from the infinite riches of his grace and my dependence upon him, my trust in him becomes more and more absolute as time goes by. And that's why it's so important for us to grasp that we grow in grace. This is the link between growing in grace and growing in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Because the more I get to know Him, the more I will grow. 
in grace. So Peter says, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And the Apostle Paul personalizes it, you know. This is not doctrine for him. This is autobiography. Everything that I was, he says, I count it loss for him. All that I gained, I gladly write off for him. And they're asking, and what now is the great ambition, Paul? Well, it's very simple. That I may know him. And when he prays for the Ephesians, it is that you may know him better. That's what growing in grace is inevitably married to in the Scripture. Growing in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the miracle, all unknown to you, will take place that you will gradually be changed into his image as you get to know him better. Now there's another question that arises and it takes us to the third theme, which is the means of grace. The question is, if growing in grace is something which God alone can accomplish, why does he command us then to grow? For that's a command, you know, of Peter's, grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Well, the answer to that is really important and really important for understanding the Christian life. Whereas the new birth and adoption are works of God in which we have no cooperation whatsoever anymore than a child cooperates in being conceived and born. The child is acted upon, and the new birth is like that. When a child is adopted, they don't go around the babies and say, now who would you like to choose as your father? The adoption is a unilateral decision of the parents, so they advertise it, chosen son or chosen daughter. But... The simple fact is our growth as God's children requires our wholehearted obedience to the plan and purpose of God for our growth. The human analogy is clear, isn't it? There may be a child who's not getting the correct diet or enough exercise or fresh air and so on, and we may say to that child if they're old enough to understand you need to get the right food. You'll never grow. You need to get out and get fresh air. You need to take exercise in order to grow. There are some things that will keep you back from growing. When I was a boy, the thing that kept everybody back from growing, the answer to every stunted growth, according to my mother, was that they had smoked. If you smoke, you'll never grow up. That was the answer. Now, that may well be true. But it was a philosophy that was simple, and my mother held it, and it's probably the reason that as a small boy I was terrified to do it. In the spiritual life, there are things that will stop you growing. They are disobedience to God. They are a refusal to take the food of the Word of God and satisfy your soul on it. They are an unwillingness to come to God and to call Him Abba, Father. There are so many of them that will keep you from growing. And we need to put ourselves under the influence of what our forefathers would have called the means of grace. Frequently people in the north will speak, not of going to services, but of sitting under the means 
And what they mean by that is coming under the public ministry of the Word of God, engaging in the public worship of God. But also, they ought to mean the private study of Holy Scripture, the reading of the kind of literature that is going to minister to your growth, the private secret seeking of God for yourself, communing with Him in the holy place. That's what the means of grace imply. I'll tell you something else. There are not only these obvious means of grace, there are some of the means of grace that are not so obvious, the trials and testings and difficulties and tragedies even of life. You do not need me to point out to you that there are hundreds of people that we will probably know or know of who have found a point of growth in their spiritual experience when they came under profound and painful trial. And ultimately, it produced something that nothing else could. Finally, let me say to you in a word, there is a goal for spiritual growth, not only Do we need to see Peter addressing the origins of it in the grace of God, the nature of it in our transformation of character by that grace into the likeness of Jesus Christ, and the means of it in the Word of God that he has given to us and in so many other pathways of grace. But we need to realize it has a goal, and the goal is in the last sentence of the verse and of his book. To him be glory, both now and forever. And that's why God wants us to grow. I tell you, my dear friends, there is a revenue of glory that God gains from lives that display the beauty of Jesus Christ. And if I may tell you where he is robbed of his glory, it is in a life that boasts of the new birth, but is still playing around with nursery toys. May God help us in his mercy to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Teach us, blessed Lord, your word. Open our hearts to you. And take us forth into this day with a vision for what you mean us to be. For the glory of your name. Amen.